Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming to the, the session this morning. Thanks for coming to Drupal Camp Asheville. Uh, this is my second Drupal Camp Asheville. I haven't been in quite a few years, but happy to be back. Um, this is the uh, form alterations presentation, and my subtitle is Getting What You Want in Drupal Without Hacking. Um, my name is Mark Gerald. I work at a uh, library, large library system called Rich and Library in South Carolina in Columbia. Um, let's see, I've been dru doing Drupal since uh, 2008, so about a little over six years. Uh, I've had a lot of fun with it, and uh, if you want to get in touch with me later on, I can give you a business card, or uh, you can find me on Drupal.org. My username's at the show. Um, I maintain a few, di few different modules on there, um, so mostly do uh, coding and development. And I'm going to show you kind of a it's kind of a beginner session session today. It's kind kind of a little bit of advanced. You'll need to understand PHP. I'll try and try and walk you through it a little bit. Um, we're going to build uh, a really basic module uh, that that puts into practice some of these form alterations ideas that I'm I'm going to talk about. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is going to be sort of a how-to session. I'm going to do mostly demo, not not too much uh, on slides. Um, and I'm going to show you how, how you would go about uh, using a function that's built into Drupal or a hook that's built into Drupal um, to modify form elements. Um, and these can be form elements created either by Drupal core modules or by contrib modules that you might have installed on your site. Uh, you can even modify your own modules if you like. I've done that before. Um, so why would you need to alter forms? Um, this is something I've done on, on most of the sites I've worked with in the past. Um, basically, it's for custom functionality. If you want things to work slightly differently than you know, the original module author, uh, how they built the form, if you want to change it around slightly, um, it can give you more control over how things ap appear in the forms. Um, you know, the descriptions, the order of, of things as they appear on the forms, how your users are going to interact with them, you can make their lives a little bit easier. Um, and you can, use, you can use this to increase efficiency for users that are entering things into Drupal. Um, for example, one of, the, one of the first examples I'm going to show today is uh, the user add form, which is the form you see to the right on the screenshot there. Um, the example I'll give is uh, a site administrator is going to be entering in a lot of new users into the site. They're going to be, let's say they have like one or two new people that they add to the site as a staff member every day. And it's not a predictable list, you know, that you could potentially import into the site. It's it's like a manual step that they're going to have to do every day, um, and something that you could do to make their lives easier. If they're all going to have the same uh, domain name on the end of their email address, you could actually go ahead and use uh, hook form alter to put in that domain name into that field, so they wouldn't have to like, manually type at example.com, you know, every day when they they add those people in. And we'll look at quite a few more examples than that. Um, so I mentioned hacking in the in the session title. So uh, the question is, why not just hack it? Um, the reasons for for not hacking. I mean, you could just go into the user module that's built into Drupal core that makes that add user form, and you could technically change it, and you could put that at example.com into the field. Um, but the reasons not to do that, um, maintaining something that's hacked is is more difficult. Um, you know, every time that Drupal comes out with a, a security release or a maintenance release, you're going to have to go back in and either make that same change again to the code, or you may forget to make that same change that you hacked into the code, um, and then somebody's going to come back and ask you, where did that go? That you know, I, I used to not have to enter in at example.com in that email address field. Why isn't that there anymore? Um, you can say, well, I forgot, about, I forgot about it. I have to go make that change again. Um, so when you upgrade, when you do those Drupal upgrades, you may lose those changes. Uh, another big benefit is, you know, in Drupal, we're part of a community, right? We can help each other out with problems that we have. Um, if you start hacking, you know, the modules and, and Drupal core, the person that you're trying to get help from, potentially in an issue queue, may not be able to uh, sort of be on the same page with you. Their, th their code is now different from your code, so they're going to have a harder time trying to figure out um, you know, what, what your problem is on your particular system, since yours is so individualized now. Uh, this this uh, function that I'm going to show you today, though, is more of a standards compliant way of, of uh, making changes to the system without hacking anything. Um, so what do we need to make it happen? Uh, there's a couple of different things uh, we're going to use. Uh, the Devel module is a, a contrib module that you can download from Drupal.org. 
Um, it's used for lots of different things with, with development. I'm just going to barely touch the surface of it with just one function that's included in it, uh, which is called DPM. Uh, and we're also going to build a custom module. I mentioned that already. And just uh, to tell you what the name of it's going to be, it's going to be uh, DC Asheville form alterations. And I'll put all these slides up, and I'll put the, the code that I write today up uh, on the session page. Or if, if not, I'll at least have it on my Twitter account. So look at twitter.com slash at the show. Um, and you'll be able to uh, download everything. So you don't have to try and code along with me today. Uh, let's see. Is that going to show up well enough? Yeah. OK, that should be big enough since we're on this 800 by 600 display. OK. So the first thing I'm going to do is just start building my module file for the day. I'm going to add it into my uh, Drupal installation under Sites All Modules. So I'll just add a new folder here. And let's see, I'm going to label it in green to make it just a little bit easier to see on my screen here. And I'm, I'm not really talking specifically about you know, how to build a module today. I am going to do it, but I'm not going to go into great de detail in it. I'm assuming everybody already knows that or at least can get it from another session. Um, there's lots of good tutorials online about uh, how to build Drupal modules. Whoops. Um, so for my info file, that's one of the bare minimum requirements for building a module. Um, I'm just going to kind of paste in a, a snippet here. Um, basically, you need, uh, you need to give your module a name. Uh, you can add a description for it optionally. And then you say which version of Drupal core it's going to go with. And then you can give your own version to the module. So I'm just calling it a 1.0. And then package will control uh, where it appears on the module page on the modules list. Uh, you, can, you can put a package, and it'll kind of categorize it in that way. Oops. And I apparently created this in the wrong spot. So I'm going to cut that out of untitled and put it into this file. Close untitled to stop confusing myself. And then you also need a module file, so I'll make that real fast. Uh, let's see. Um, and generally, when you start when you start a module file, uh, you put a little sort of declaration at the beginning about what's going to be in the file. Um, let's see. Now, I mentioned the Devel module. I've already got that installed on my system. It's already, it's already on there. Um, and we're going to be looking at basically just sort of a vanilla uh, Drupal 7 site here. There's not, not too much going on. I've configured it just a little bit, but, but barely. Uh, let's see. OK, so the first example that I mentioned in the, uh, in the slides was making a change to this form, right, uh, where the person's going to come in. And every day, they're going to be, at, you know, our site administrator is going to be adding some person, uh, you know, person at example.com. So in order to prevent them from having to type that in every time, we'll go ahead and have that be, be sort of pre-populated for them. Uh, so the first thing I need to do is, uh, take advantage of a hook that's in Drupal. It's called hook form alter. Uh, and you can find out about this or any other uh, Drupal function on api.drupal.org. Um, let's see. And basically, like it says here, this function is a function to perform alterations before a form is rendered. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of copy and paste this. Um, and this function does exist in Drupal 8 as well, if anybody's uh, wondering about Drupal 8. Um, I'm, I'm using Drupal 7 today, uh, just for this example. But uh, you'll be able to do the majority of these things in, in Drupal 8 as well, too. So uh, 
And then anytime you're doing a uh, hook implementation in Drupal, you're usually supposed to put a uh, comment at the beginning that just basically says implements hook form alter. Oops. And then, and then whenever you're taking advantage of a hook in Drupal, which is sort of, if you don't know what a hook is, it's sort of an opportunity to uh, tap into what's going on and, and manipulate uh, the system. So we're gonna we're gonna manipulate forms. So we're using hook form alter, and you just replace the word hook with the name of whatever your module is. Um, there are three parameters that are coming in that are available when you're looking at your forms. Uh, there's the big, uh, the first one is, is huge usually, the form array. Um, there's a form state, uh, which contains things like, um, you know, if the user's previously submitted the form, there could be information about their, about their submitted data in there, that sort of thing. Um, and then the form ID uh, is usually just a string, and it's sort of the system name of the form. Every form in Drupal has sort of a system name of how Drupal uh, speaks about it or, or addresses it. Uh, so the first thing I'm gonna do is just use a built-in uh, Drupal function <laughs> that's called Drupal set message, and I'm gonna have it print out the form ID for every uh, form on the site. So that's taking advantage of that third parameter that, that comes into this function. Um, I also need to enable this module because I haven't, you know, I've just built it. It's, it's not enabled yet, so it's not gonna be working yet. Uh, so we'll jump over to the uh, modules page and turn it on. <coughs> um, I do have the, uh, the module filter uh, module turned on on this page, so that's that's one sm slight difference you might see versus uh, a vanilla Drupal install. It just makes it a little bit easier to categorize things on the modules page and search. Okay, so you can already see um, my my message starting to print out here, form ID is system modules. So there's there's a form on the modules page that's called system modules. So it's printing that out and telling me the form ID of, of that form. Uh, and it should do that kind of throughout the site now. Any, any page that I go to that has a form on it, it'll print out. So like this one has two forms on it, user filter form and user admin account. Um, but the one we were looking at was the add user form. So this one has a system ID or a form ID of user register form. So now that we know that, now that we know the system name of this form, we can tell Drupal to do specific things to just this one form and not, you know, not every form in the system. So I'm gonna copy that to my clipboard and then go back over here. Uh, and what you can do is inside of this function, uh, you can say if the form ID is equal to the user register form, then you can do something specific to that and it'll just take effect on that one form. Um, so let's print out some more information about that form. Uh, and I'm gonna show some, some bad ways and then slowly getting better ways to print out the, in, the details of the form. So we'll start with print R here. This is like a built-in PHP function for printing out the details of like an object or an array. So we'll print out all the information about this form, the system information about this form. So it's crazy and hideous and makes no sense. So you've got that. Uh, Drupal core has a built-in function called debug that you can use to print out information like that. It's a little bit better. You can see the, the information being printed out here about all of the elements of the form. Still difficult to look at. So that's why I recommend the Devel module because uh, it includes this uh, Crumo library that makes, makes things a lot easier to understand. Uh, DPM, I think it stands for Drupal print message. I'm not 100% sure about that, but that's, that's a Devel module function. And when you do that, you get this. It's a lot easier to use in my opinion. Um, you can kind of click through and expand and contract things and it just gives you a more a more visually logical way of moving through a large item like an object or an array that has nested elements within it, like the form array does. Um, and basically you need, you need this in order to inspect how these fields are being created on the form. Um, so we need to find something about the email address field. 
And so really what you're doing is you're looking through the form array here for anything related to the email field. And I don't really see anything right off the bat that says email. Um, and I know just from looking at this one in the past that it's actually under account. There's a subarray called account on this form. And then most of those fields are under here. Um, so you can see mail. So if we expand that one, you can see underneath there that it has a type of text field. It has a title of email address, 254 maximum length, and then a description, and it's a required field. You can see it doesn't have a default value right now. Um, and actually, that's, that's kind of what we want to take advantage of, right? We want to already have something be in that field when the user starts to fill it out. So um, actually, what I'm going to do here is just kind of copy this. Um, and the dot, dot, dot is standing for the object that we're looking at. It's the form array. So if we put something in there, if we tell it to go ahead and have a default value, then when we reload the form, it should be there. So let's put in that example.com. I'll save it and then refresh. And then there you can see it. it's there now. So every time the person starts the form and goes back to add a new user, it'll, it'll be there and already be filled in. Um, let's see. Let me, uh, let me bring up another API documentation page real fast. Uh, there's another one that's super helpful in this. I can't see the, let me see if that's the right thing or not. I can't see my full address bar. Yeah, there we go. It's the form API reference. And I also have links to all these pages at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the slides, which I'll post. So you can get them from there. Um, but this form API reference page tells you about all of the different types of form elements that exist uh, using the Drupal form API, all the different types of things that you can create or can modify. Um, so you've got like, you know, check, check boxes and uh, radio buttons and select boxes and text fields and text areas. It also tells you uh, in the rows here whether or not certain, um, I forget what they call them. Uh, Let me scroll back up to the top here. Field set. Properties. They call them properties. So the, the rows are the properties that you can assign to each, each of those form element types. So like a, uh, a checkbox you could give attributes to, which would add like an HTML attribute to that input. Um, let's see. So the next thing I'm going to uh, do just as an example here on the add user form is try and change the status field because I don't like this field on the add user form. Uh, I never create a user and then immediately want them to be blocked. So I, I feel like it's just kind of like an unnecessary thing to even be on that form. Um, and a lot of times when you're having somebody fill out a form, you want it to kind of be as efficient as possible. You don't want them to have to fill in extra information because they may not fill it out, particularly if it's users versus a staff member. Um, so if we can eliminate some of the overhead of what they're having to do, I always like that. So I'm going to try and eliminate this status field from the form so that it just doesn't even appear there. Uh, so let's take a look in the uh, form array again. Uh, and it, I th believe it's under account as well. And you can see status is there. So this one has a different type. The first one we looked at was a text field, right? This one's radios. Uh, it has a title. It has a default value of 1 this time, so that's already filled in. And 1, if we look at the options, is active. So by default, when a person fills out the field, fills out the form, this field is going to be filled in with active. Um, so really, all we want to do is we, we still want to have that go in when the person submits the form, or else there'll be an error. Uh, so we can just simply change this type from radios. And if we look at the form API reference page here under, under special elements, you can see that there's a hidden type. And if I click on that, it'll jump down in the page a little bit. And uh, they give a usage example. And you can see basically to make a hidden type form element, you just say type is hidden. So I'm going to try and do that. <laughs> so we'll change type from radios. Whoops. <laughs> All right, I'm going to type it up. <laughs> yeah, 
So it's under account, status, whoops. Sorry, I usually use a mouse. I'm not, I'm not big on, uh, on trackpads. Uh, and let's see, so that we're going to change the type instead of being radios to just be hidden. Save that and then refresh. Sorry? Yeah, that's right. Um, because because it has that default value, that will stay. I'm not making any changes to that. And because it's going to be changed into a hidden field, it will still technically submit and the information will go in. It's just the person won't visually see it and they won't have the option to change the person to blocked. So, you know, that's up to you to decide whether they need that option to change it to blocked. Um, they can still go into uh, you know, the, edit, the user edit form later on and change the status of the person to blocked, but they just won't have the option on this initial creation form to do it. So, and these are just examples too. You know, they're, I'm just trying to give you some, sort of some examples of things that you can possibly do just to give you ideas. Um, so after I refresh, this, this stat, what we should see is just this status field will disappear. And it's gone. So if you were to view source on the page, you'd still see that it's there. It's just marked as a hidden input now. So it just makes the, sh makes the form a little bit shorter. Um, let's see. Uh, the next example on this form is if the, um, let's say every person that, every new user that this uh, hypothetical admin is adding in is always going to be a staff member. So every time they come to this form, they have to check this box and then click create new account. We could save them the step of checking the box if they're always going to be staff members. Uh, just sort of another efficiency thing. So let's try and do that. Uh, so we'll look under account again. And then you can see roles here. It's a set of check boxes. And there are two options that aren't pre-selected, administrator and staff. And you can see staff has a uh, numeric value of four. Um, the only unusual thing about doing this one is that the default value it's expecting, the previous ones we were looking at, the default value was like a string or an integer. This one's it's expecting an array as the default value. So that's what we're going to fill in. We're going to tell it it's, it has a default value of four, meaning the person's always a staff member. So let's try and do that. So instead of just typing four here, we have to make it an array. It's expecting an array. So you can see that from the, from the Devel modules display. So if I save that and then refresh, let's see. I like to actually like see it on screen happen. So, so this, this checkbox should be checked after I reload. Okay. So just kind of another little time saver. Um, I'm going to go back to my code here for a minute. Uh, usually the way you'll see these uh, hook form alters done is instead of having a bunch of if statements, if you want to you know, make changes to a bunch of different forms in the system, just kind of to make the coding shorter, they'll use a switch statement instead of an if statement. So I'm going to, I'm going to change that uh, right now. So I'm just going to manipulate my code a little bit here. Take that out. I'll put a So I'm going to switch based on the form ID. And then uh, within a switch statement, you kind of put these if, if uh, qualifiers as cases. So you can say case. I'm going to get rid of all of that. So. Indent a little bit. And then I'm going to put in a default case as well and have it print out that form ID so that future for forms that we look at will have that. Um, so this is basically the same code I as I had a minute ago. Um, it's just kind of coded slightly differently as a switch statement instead of if statements. This form's not going to have that message on it. That's right. So if we uh, if we refresh this particular form now, this uh, form ID equals user register form. Since this is no longer the default case, that will disappear. We'll still have our DPM there, but so 
Um, and that's what I'm going to do now is switch to a different form. So I'm going to go to the add content basic page form. Um, and this one, uh, I'm going to make a change to uh, contrib modules form elements with some difficulty, some intended difficulty to hopefully help, you ex help explain something. Um, so we, we've got this uh, page title settings on the page creation form here. Uh, this is coming from a contrib module called page title, which is used uh, generally for SEO purposes so that you can make a change to what appears in the uh, HTML title tag on a page. Um, the example I'm going to give here is uh, someone has asked us to move this page title so that it's not down here in these lower settings. It needs to be up here close to the built-in Drupal title. It needs to be like right here between the title field and the body field. Um, so how would you go about doing that? Um, well, we know the name of the form that we're looking at right here. This is the one we want to make a modification to. It's the page note form. So I'm going to copy that and then make a new uh, case within my switch statement here. I'll print out the form details. And then, let's see, reload here. We'll look at the array, form array. And I'm looking for something that has page title uh, title is there, but that's just the, the basic title field. It's not the one we're looking for. And I don't see anything related to page title. And this brings me to a difficult to explain topic, uh, but I'll try my best. Um, I, I know that it should be here kind of on the top level, but we're not seeing it. And the reason is that when our code executes, the page title module's code has not yet executed. Um, I've got my, uh, this is a database editing application uh, called SQL Pro. I'm going to show you uh, the system table, if I can get it to fit here on the screen. So within the system table in Drupal, um, it's, it's a place that System information is stored about all of the modules and themes that you have installed. Um, we've, we should find our, uh, our module in here if I sort by name. Well, let's see, DC Asheville form alterations, there it is. Uh, form alterations and, and actually a lot of code in Drupal is executed based on the system tables field uh, of weight. There's this concept of weight within Drupal for execution of various things. Uh, the, the idea is that things with a lighter weight will happen earlier and things with a heavier weight will happen later. Um, that You'll see that in menus and, and lots of different places, block categorization in Drupal. Um, so that's, that's kind of just a way to order things, the order of execution of things. Um, if all things are equal, if the weight is zero or, the, or two things have a weight of one or it's, it's, it's basically the equal weight, then the secondary ordering is alphabetical. So because our module has a weight of zero and then if we find the page title module that's, that's building that form element that I'm looking at, there it is. Let me scroll over to its weight field. It also has a weight of zero. Because P comes alphabetically later, then D does, P is happening later. So what we need to do um, in order to be able to see and modify what's going on to the form from the page title module, we need to either A, change the name of our module so that it comes alphabetically after P, or we can change the weight of our module so that it happens after the page title module is done. So that's what we're going to do is change the, the weight of the module. Um, you could do this by simply editing the, you know, I'm looking at a database editing application here. I could edit the, uh, the row in the database table that, that corresponds to our module, but I'm not going to do it that way. Because um, if someone else was to install this module, like if I was to share it with a friend and they tried to install it on their system, it wouldn't work for them because they hadn't made that same database change. So I want to actually put it in, in the code and make that same change. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, uh, that's something that you would want to do right off the bat when the module's installed. So I'm going to make an install file, which is another type of uh, file that you can make 
as part of your module. It's just dot install. Uh, there's a lot of different things you can put in an install file. I'm just going to do, uh, let's see. I've got that saved as DC3. I'm just going to kind of drop this in and then explain the code to you. Um, I've got my just file declar declaration at the beginning and then a, a note about an implementation of hook install. So I've got DC form alterations underscore install. This is another hook within Drupal that you can use. Um, and this is just, you can put any code inside of that that you want to execute when the installation happens. Um, so what we're going to do, like my comment says here, is let's change the weight of the module so that it can modify form elements after other modules have finished building all of them. Um, and it is possible that other modules that you install could have a weight heavier than 10. Um, if you run into problems after you do this, you might take a look at that system table and see if maybe it needs to be higher than 10. 10 is fairly high, though. There are a few that few common contrib modules that have weights higher than 10, like C Tools, I think, does, and a few other ones. but. Um, so this is just a, a query that's uh, going to run on the system table and change the, the weight of the module to 10 when, it, when it's installed. Now, because I've already got this module installed on my system, this is not going to run. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just quickly uninstall and reinstall the module. And that should cause it to execute. Does anyone have any questions while we're reinstalling real fast? Whoops. OK, it's reinstalled. So theoretically, that code has now run. I'll just uh, go into the database to double check and make sure I'm right here. Refresh this view. And now, if we go over here to the weight section, it should say 10. So it says 10. Right. I'm going to close out that install file. So now, if we refresh that page node form that we're looking at, we should see the page title elements. Um, I don't know if anyone noticed the, the number of elements in that array, but it just increased, I think, from 38 to 41. So in addition to the page title module, we're now hap our code is now happening after a few other modules as well. Uh, so now page title is there. And let's see, what was my original intention with this field? We were going to move it, reposition it, take it out of the, the, uh, out of the vertical tabs, thanks, that it's in. Um, and the vertical tabs are uh, whoops, a group. And you can see that it has a group of additional settings. Um, a few of these other ones are in that same group, like path is in there as well. You'll see it has a group of additional settings. So in order to cancel that out and take it out of that uh, vertical tabs section of the page, we're just going to set the group equal to uh, nothing. Set it equal to nothing. OK, so now we should uh, see that it just kind of is off by itself at this point. So it's not down here anymore. It's just right above here. Still not the right place, but it's out of the, it's out of the vertical tabs anyway. Uh, let's go back and look at it again and see what else we want to do. OK, it has a weight right now. And this is sort of similar to the weight we were just looking at in the database. But uh, in this case, the weight is the weight of the form elements on the page. So things that have a lighter weight, uh, you know, 0, 1 should be at the top. If they have any negative numbers, they would be even higher than that. And then 35 is, is pretty heavy. Uh, so it's, it's close to the bottom of the form right now. 
Uh, let's go up and look at that title field that already exists on the page and see what the weight on that one is. So that one's negative 5. And what we're wanting to do is position it right after that one. So I'll try negative 4 and see how that works out. So we're going to change the weight. See if it moves up in the form a little bit here. Okay, it's not the bottom anymore. That's good. Okay, so it's right in the right position now. Um, another thing we could do is uh, change. This is this is actually a field set instead of just a basic field. There's actually a field inside of what Drupal calls a field set. Um, we can actually make some changes to how that field set appears as well. Like if we want it to be initially expanded so that the person can type into it right away without having to click. Uh, there's some form properties that can be used there. Uh, you can see init initially it's collapsed, we, and that's set to true, just a Boolean value. So we could change that to false, and it would be expanded automatically when the person views the form. So it's expanded by default now. Um, you can also take away the ability to collapse it. Like if you don't want to have the person have that ability to expand and contract it, and you don't want to see the little triangle there, uh, you can change that as well. You can see right now it has a property of co collapsible is set to true. So we could change collapsible to false, and that would mean that like it's not collapsed and it can't be collapsed. Set that to false as well. OK, so now it doesn't have the triangle next to it. This is not a hyperlink, and it can't be expanded or contracted. How can you get it out of that set? Um, you would have to do some pretty heavy restructuring. You can actually see you can see the field inside of the field set if you look here, because um, you can see that this this has a type of field set, and then and then within it, well, no, within it here you can see the actual text field. So if you modified the array and pulled this outside of to where it's not nested within the page title field set, then then you could make it appear that way. You you could completely kill the field field set if you if you wanted to too. Yeah. Side by side, two fields instead of having like first name. You want to have first name and last name, and you want them on the same row. Yeah, um, <laughs> I would probably do that with CSS. Um, that's that's how I've done that in the past. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how else you could do it. There's definitely a lot of room to be creative here, though. Um, Let's see. I'm going to make changes to one more form uh, really quickly. I know I'm running low on time here. Uh, we're going to try and change the uh, login form. I'm going to add a, open a new window here. Uh, let's see. Triple seven user. So I'm going to try and change this, this form and do a couple of things on it. Um, you can see that it has a form ID of user login. So I'm going to take advantage of that. On the user login form, print out the form information. Um, you can even add completely new elements to forms that aren't there already. Uh, you don't have to just change existing things. Uh, so I'm going to try and add in a uh, like a little intro paragraph here that doesn't exist yet. So I'm going to add. 
and uh, there's a actually the default type of form element that you would add is called markup um, and basically it's just like an HTML add whatever you want in type of field uh, you can put you know paragraph tags in there or in anything you'd like to uh, so I'm going to take advantage of that so I'm going to say this is a completely new form element so it's going to be an array and uh, the markup that goes into it is going to be log in using the form below. Oh, doesn't really matter. Your username is the. Oops. Same as your staff ID. And then. Well, I'll leave it like that for now. Oops. You had an equal sign, that should be a double arrow. Thank you. <laughs> no, still got something. Form instruction. You're ending the element with semi, it needs to be a comma. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so that's technically on the form right now. It's not at the top where I wanted it to be. Um, so we can play with the weight again. I'm going to go ahead and just quickly assign it a weight of zero. OK, so it's up at the top. Like I said, you can put uh, code in there as well for markup. So you know, be careful with who, who, you, let you, who you let do this, I guess. But, uh, and you can add, I mean, you could add new text fields and things in there as well, but just be aware that just because you say, you know, uh, phone number doesn't mean that it's actually going to collect the phone number. Like, you need to actually have some processing on the end that does something with the, the information that's being entered in by the user. Um, I'm not going to go into how you would do that, but just be aware of that. <coughs> Uh, something cool that I did recently on this uh, on this user login form was we uh, at the library we use pin numbers instead of passwords, uh, which are you know numeric. So when the person is uh, filling out this form on uh, on a device, let's see if I can scroll down here. When they come into the password field and start typing into it. It looks terrible on the screen, but you can clearly see that they don't get the numeric keypad. They get the, uh, you know, the alphabetical keypad. And by default, none of our users need to type in alphabetical characters there. So what if you wanted to change it more to like a real like pin number field? Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, change the first change the title. Let's see. Uh, so you can see I've got the name field and the pass field here is the password field. So I'm going to change this title to say pin and then change the description a little bit as well. Um, and just for time's sake, I think I'm going to paste those in. OK, so I'm changing the title of the field to pin number, and then I'm adding a description underneath it instead of what it says right now, which is enter the password that accompanies your username. We're going to change it to say use your numeric pin number here. It should be four digits long. And then additionally, I'm adding a new uh, section that is not in the password field right now. Um, there's no attributes being applied to that. So I'm going to apply a new HTML <coughs> attribute to that input field, which is pattern and say that the person's going to be using digits 0 through 9 in that field. So if we uh, refresh it here, you can see the pin number, and then it's got the description that I ent entered in there. Um, if I try and type in uh, alphabetical characters, it's generally it's up to the browser to say, no, you didn't match the pattern. A lot of the modern browsers can do this, um, but then additionally, if you're if you're using uh, a phone, let's see if I can refresh here. 
Apparently scrolling on the trackpad doesn't work to do this. So now we've got the numeric keypad where they can just like punch in the numbers a little more quickly. So it's just kind of a little time saver. This, that's basically all all this stuff is, is little time savers and you know make people's lives easier. Um, let's see. I've got I've got more examples, but I don't think I have much time left. So does anyone want to ask any questions about anything or talk about any specific examples? Should I do one more example? Okay, I'll go for it and just leave if you need to. Um, let's see, so this one's a little more advanced. This is, uh, let's see, we're gonna try and do like a redirect after uh, the person adds a new user in. So I'm gonna close this. We'll go back to the people form and add a new user. Um, you can see in this form right now, uh, there's a submit array and there's a function that gets called after the form is submitted. It's just, it's called user register submit. Um, we're gonna try and add an additional submit function in there that's gonna redirect the person. Um, let's, say, let's say after, generally after you fill out this form, let me show you what happens usually. So testing seven, testing seven at example.com, testing, testing. So usually when they fill out the form, it takes them right back to the form as if they want to fill out, fill it out again and add another user in. So it's kind of a, an assumption is being made. But what if uh, the person that's adding the new users tells us that actually when they submit the form, they usually just do one a day. It'd be better to go to the listing page and see that the person was added there. Let's say that's their preference. So how would you do something like that? Um, so we're, go we're gonna tap into that uh, Tap into that submit subarray that's there and add in a, an additional function that's going to execute it after this user register submit executes. Okay, so I'm going back to the user register form up here. Okay, so we're going to do form submit and then because this is already an existing array we need to add another uh, another element to it so that's what that opening and closing brackets is there um, and I'm gonna just add a new function in this you could call your function anything you want to it's not really important that you necessarily use the same name as your module at this point I tend to do that just for consistency and to make other developers lives easier um, if they ever look at this module but so I'll, I'll name my function form alterations user register form redirect. So basically I'm saying after you submit the form in addition to the submission function that you're already doing, do this other function too. But now I have to define what that function is so that it'll actually do something. Just put a comment up here. Um, redirect user after they add a new user on the form. And uh, this is pretty simple, actually. There's a built-in uh, Drupal function just called Drupal go to, which is like send them to some address. After, you know, when you get to this line. So we're going to send them to the listing page, which is at admin slash people. So super simple. Now if we refresh and then we add a new person in, testing eight. Then they should go, instead of back to this page, they should go to the listing page where they can see the users there. Uh, let me jump back to Keynote real fast because I did have a couple more things on, on Keynote. Um, hook form alter can, it's not just uh, for use in a module. You can also use it in your theme in template.php. 
Um, but the only problem with doing that is if you switch to another theme, then those changes will no longer be applied. So like what I just did, it's theme independent. It'll happen regardless of which theme is being used on the site. But if you built it into, if you built it into a particular theme you know, that you were using for your front end, and then you suddenly switched or built a new theme, then that code would no longer be happening. You would need to pull it into the new theme. Um, also, be sure if you're using the Devel module that I showed, probably want to turn that off in production, maybe not even have it on your production server because there's a lot of power in that module. You just kind of want to be safe with it and maybe just use it on you know, your local, local site or your development site. Um, and I got a couple further reading links. Uh, there's a really good article that came out a few years ago uh, from Lullabot on this. Uh, and there's lots of videos you can pay to watch as well uh, on Drupalize Me and Build a Module and whatnot uh, on how to do this. But uh, there's a really good article that talks about the majority of what I've talked about today. Um, there's, I've got links here to the uh, API documentation for Hook Form Alter. Um, there's a form API quick start that kind of covers a lot of the different types of form elements that you can make. And there's that form API reference, which is that big grid that I, I showed that had all of the different types of fields and the, the attributes that you can add to them. And that's it. Anybody have any questions? All right. Thanks, everyone.